coming out to the house of the Lord on this wet, rainy, nasty evening. But, you know, we need the rain. And the Lord knows what we have need of. So, very thankful for that. Um, we want to go to the Lord in prayer as we open up tonight. And we have a number that have specific needs. We want to continue to remember our board and our church family and uh, wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit there. We want to continue to remember Sister Nell, um, Chuck Breland. Um, has had some improvement and he's in rehab, but uh, he's had a setback, and so we just need to need to continue to pray for Chuck and for Elaine and for Vicky. Um, Jen goes to see about her knee tomorrow, and we need we need favor. Uh, she needs answers and favor, so let's uh, pray that direction if you would. And then um, we still have so many people battling COVID. We have a significant number from our congregation that is still battling COVID. Um, so we want to uh, pray for, for all of those that are struggling in, in that area. Um, and also I got a text um, this afternoon from Linda Roberts that her um, nephew's wife, this, is, this would be Brandy, um, <clears throat> is um, sick and in the emergency room and needs a touch from the Lord tonight. So let's pray for Brandy if we would. Um, then we want to uh, continue to remember, of course, Pam and her family and the loss of her daddy and also Sister Sandra and the loss of Brother Mac. And um, then uh, Edgar and Janora Reed, who are our Fire Bible missionaries, um, Janora's father passed away. And um, that service, I believe, will be Friday. So let's remember that family as well. And then um, we have so many that are battling with cancer or the effects of cancer treatments or um, we, we even have some that are undergoing tests um, that have that big C word looming scarily at them and um, we want to continue to remember all of those our missionaries um, one of specifically I got a couple of text messages from Bob and Sylvia this afternoon and Sincel which is the um, language school where they, where they are at, they have had a COVID outbreak. And um, so far, Bob and Sylvia are in the clear, but they have had a known exposure. So she just said, please pray. Uh, if anybody in their little quad or whatever comes up positive, then they will be housebound for at least 10 days. So they were trying to get some groceries in the house today, you know, pending thinking that was going to happen, but she said, please pray. There are a couple of them that really already have COVID and really need a touch from the Lord. So let's let's pray for Sensel there in Costa Rica. Um, you know, many of our countries are going back. Uh, they're going on semi-martial law again, um, and they are uh, now requiring uh, the vaccines. Um, someone that is very near and dear to my heart that we all know and love um, in their country, it is now required to get in the grocery store. You cannot go to the grocery store or go to a restaurant or anywhere like that unless you produce your vaccine card. Um, so, you know, it's our missionaries are really dealing with a lot right now. So let's continue to, to pray for our missionaries. Um, lost family members, I think every family here is hit by that, that need. Uh, anybody else have a prayer request tonight? Let's pray for Billy Downey. Yes, anybody else? Okay, she's been battling this COVID too. So let's pray for Sister Polly. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we love you. You are so good. And God, it has already been a a difficult week in so many people's lives. But Father, I have seen your hand move so faithfully. Nothing that is going on has caught you by surprise. You are the creator. 
Lord, and you are the director. You are in charge. Father, we trust you. We ask, Lord, that you would look down into each of these needs that we have called before you tonight. And God, there are unspoken requests around this room. And Lord, there's more than just physical needs tonight. Lord, there are emotional needs. There are spiritual needs. God, there are financial needs. God, you see and you know. And I'm so glad tonight that you love us so much and that you will meet us at our point of need regardless of where it's at. Whether we're even here or whether we're around the world like our missionaries, you're there. And I'm so thankful. And Lord, we just ask that you would move in these situations. Show yourself strong and mighty and powerful, Lord, that you would receive the glory and the honor that lives would be changed as a result of your hand at work. And Lord, tonight is all around this building. Your word is being broken open. I pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom and guidance and direction, Lord, and you would help us to rightly divide that word, and we would take it, we would apply it to our hearts, and we would go away saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord, and I have learned and I have changed, and I've been challenged. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Okay, I hope y'all are in a talkative mood tonight because I need you to talk to me, okay? So y'all can, y'all can speak up, and if you have more than one word to say, I'll probably put the microphone in your face. So, um, but, but I do need you to talk back to me tonight. Um, we are um, cruising right on through our... Um, series that we've been studying on the listen series where we started in Genesis and we're headed all the way through to the book of Revelation and um, when I started counting the lessons up and realized that I was going to have this one to teach I got so excited because I like to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is the baptism of the Holy Spirit Um, the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is our distinctive doctrine That is what sets us apart, makes us different from your other traditional evangelical um, denominations, okay? It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that sets us apart, and it's this truth that explains our passion and our power to witness, okay? Now, we heard, I'm trying to think of where I heard Y'all, I'm telling you, I have been in so many services, and I have listened to so so many podcasts. I don't remember where I heard something anymore. Isn't that terrible? Um, However, um, I do know this to be a fact, the fact that the Assemblies of God is the largest mission-sending force in the world. Okay, I I was thinking it was Brother Jerry, but I wasn't 100% sure. Okay, so we are the largest sending force into the mission field. You know, when we think about missions, we think about Nepal, and we think about Ecuador, and we think about Costa Rica, and we think about Colombia, and we think about those places, but sometimes we forget about Riderwood, and Lisman, and Pennington, and Toxie, and, you know, sometimes we forget that, Once we leave this sanctuary, we are on a mission field, okay? And the baptism in the Holy Spirit is that element that gives us our passion and our power for missions, okay? And it is that distinctive doctrine. It sets us apart. There are a lot of people who are um, fearful of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I would say that it was because they have not been taught. I was one of those people, okay? I I grew up in a Methodist church. Love my Methodist friends. Love my Baptist friends. I grew up in a Methodist church. And when I first encountered Pentecost, I was scared, you know, because I had never been taught. And so um, I think maybe that's one reason why I like to teach on this topic is because I've been there before and I've been an outsider and not understanding. There's many of y'all, you're sitting there nodding your head. You kind of experience the same thing with that. Um, but it is, it is 
the distinctive force. Um, you know, Acts chapter 2 is where we, when we, we, when we talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit, we talk about the day of Pentecost, our minds just immediately say, Acts chapter 2. But we forget the fact that the Holy Spirit has been at work since in the beginning God. Okay? And the Holy Spirit has been at work this whole time. The Holy Spirit was very active and very powerful all throughout the Old Testament. It ju- the Holy Spirit just manifested differently than what now New Testament manifestations of the Holy Spirit are. Okay, But the events of the day of Pentecost, which is what you know we, we recognize here that was recorded in Acts chapter 2, was the climax of a promise that God had made centuries before. Centuries before. Matter of fact, um, you know, you can, take, you can take the baptism of the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost, and you can tie it all the way back to Mount Sinai. And that's it. That's we don't have time to do that tonight. But, but that's, a, that's a very interesting connection that, that can be woven right there, okay? But, um, but, but the, the day of Pentecost was a climax. It's like, it's like a come into fruition of what had been promised before. Um, Ezekiel... And I'm going to jump around tonight. I don't know if we got the screen running or not. You can grab your phone or grab your Bible out if it's not popping up. Uh, we're going to jump around to numbers of scriptures tonight. Um, and I did, not, I did not print the handouts tonight because I'm not necessarily going by the handout. I'm kind of covering a lot of things, and so I didn't do the, print, the, the handouts tonight. But we're going to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. And this is a promise that God gave through the prophet Ezekiel. And you're thinking, well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, that's Old Testament, okay? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay. I will put my spirit within you. Okay? This is Ezekiel. Now, let's go to the book of Joel. And this is the other word scripture that jumps out when we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we talk about the prophets, the prophet Joel. Okay, so Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Here comes another promise. Okay? I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. Do you hear the difference in the terminology? Okay. Ezekiel's was, I will put my spirit within you. Joel's was, I will pour out my spirit out. Can you see the difference in just the words right there? Okay, so hold on to those thoughts. Now I have some questions before we get any further, and this is where I want you to answer me. Um, What is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? We're talking about this huge topic. What is it? Y'all have to talk to me tonight. Being saturated with the Holy Spirit. Okay, anybody else? The yielding of yourself so that God can commune with you to give you the power that you need. Did I I say that right the way that you said it? Okay. Anybody else? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We talk about it a lot. Okay, so that tells us we're going to have to repent first, right? We talk about it a lot. Maybe we talk about things we don't know about. (laughs) Anybody else guilty? Yeah, sometimes we're guilty of these things. Okay, so if if I had to put it in a nutshell, this is what I would say. The, The baptism in the Holy Spirit is an endowment with power from on high for life and service. It's an endowment with power from on high for life and service. In other words, God's giving us power to live and serve him. 
to live for and serve him. Does that make sense? Right there. Okay. Um, Jesus promises his followers that they're going to receive power from on high so they could be his witnesses, right? And we were just talking about that it is our distinctive and it is what gives us the power and the, and the missions mindedness, right? Okay. The baptism in the Holy Spirit provides the believer with an empowering for witness and to live a life that's pleasing to God. Okay, so now the two scriptures we just read, one of them said, I will put my spirit within you, and the other one said, I will pour my spirit out. Okay, so I want to know tonight, what is the difference between receiving the Holy Spirit with salvation and being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Now, this is where there's a lot of confusion that runs. What's the difference between receiving the Holy Spirit with salvation and being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay. So what was said for, for those that are watching online is that when you are saved, that is when he puts the Holy Spirit within you. And then after that, then he will pour his spirit upon you. Okay? All right? Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Okay, so for our people listening, what you are basically saying is that the Holy Spirit has to draw you to the Lord, okay? And it's the Holy Spirit that, that convicts us and draws us to the Lord, and, and it's that power or him coming into us or dwelling in with us that prompts a change in our life, a, a life-changing experience so that we know we are different, Okay. That's what regeneration does to us. Okay. So the, the Holy Spirit prompts you to do those things for his kingdom and his service that need to be done. Okay? All right. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. And that's what we're talking about. Yes. It's, and it spills and it spills over it spills over okay okay 
Anybody else? These are good thoughts. We, you know, I, I, like for, I like us talking. I like us talking together. Okay. Can we all agree that the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when, we, when we're saved, when we receive the Holy Spirit, because we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. Okay, so if I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, then I don't just get Jesus over here, okay? But I get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? So he is indwelling me. Can we all agree with the fact that these are two different experiences we're talking about, okay? We, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that happens when we receive salvation, okay? And then the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a secondary work of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, probably the best passage of Scripture to, to point this out or to prove this out, if you jump over to John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus is talking to his disciples here, Okay? Uh, actually, we're going back up to verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. Was that the baptism in the Holy Spirit? No. This was the beginning of the new covenant, okay? Up until this point, it was the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, by which atonement was made for the sins of the people, and, and you know, that had to be taken care of for a person to have their sins forgiven. At this point, Jesus is coming forward. He's going to be that sacrifice, okay? He is now the new covenant, and the disciples are believing on him, and therefore we would probably, in our modern-day terminology, we would say this is when they got saved, okay? This is when they believed on Christ. So he breathed on them, and they were full of the Holy Spirit, okay? They were not speaking in tongues. This was not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, okay? So that's what's happening right there. How do we know they're two different things? Because over in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 8, what does Jesus tell them to do? Go to Jerusalem and wait for the power that's going to be poured out upon you, okay? So if they had already received the power here, what would be the purpose of going to Jerusalem and waiting, okay? There wouldn't be any purpose. It's, it's, so it's two different things. So that helps us out a, a little bit right there. But here's what we have to understand. You cannot be a believer without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Okay, number one, as Durwood said so well a few minutes ago, it's the Holy Spirit that, that convicts you and prompts you and draws you to the Lord. Spirit and in truth. We have to worship him. That's right, Papa Roy. We have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so we, you, cannot be, you cannot be a believer if you do not have this Holy Spirit indwelling in you. Okay, can't be a believer like that. But it is possible to be a believer and not experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And hear me clearly tonight, okay? I am spirit-filled. I'm thankful that I'm spirit-filled. I, I believe in this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the assemblies of God and, and the strong doctrine and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? But you do not have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues to go to heaven, okay? You do not have to be, okay? Now, I wouldn't want to try to get there without it, okay? But I'm just saying you do not have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You do have to be indwelled. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. But you do not have to have this secondary experience of, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to, to be saved and to go to heaven, okay? Um, so you can have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, okay, and never experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you will still go to heaven, okay, if you're serving the Lord. But, but you cannot 
have the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you don't first have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay, so, you know, you're not going to get out here and the Lord's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit and you're going to be walking around speaking in tongues and then, oh, I think I need to get saved. Okay, that's backwards. It doesn't work that way. Okay, um, if, you, if you go back, like we said with the prophecies when we read in Ezekiel and we read in Joel, okay, they were talking about two different things. Ezekiel said he was going to put the Spirit within you. So that's talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And and Joel talked about the pouring out of the Spirit. That's talking about the secondary work of the, of the Holy Spirit uh, or the baptism in the Holy Spirit right there. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really interesting here is it's two different parts of the Trinity working in each of the circumstances. And you got to really think about this now. You may want, if you got a pencil, you may want to write this down so you can go back and really think about what, what I'm fixing to say here. Because when I, when I first was reading this, this particular commentator and I read this statement, I thought, wait a minute, I got to go back. <laughs> I got to go back and think on that. Y'all ever read stuff like that? It's like, oh, I got to go think on that. Okay. Um, so, the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. I'm going to say that again if you're writing it down. The Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. You can go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and check that out. It's like Durwood was saying, the Holy Spirit draws you, okay? It's the Holy Spirit that's drawing you to become part of the body of Christ, okay? That's the indwelling. But the pouring out of the Spirit is Christ baptizing the believer in the Holy Spirit. Go to Matthew 3.11 for that one. So you understand the first time is the Holy Spirit doing the work. The Holy Spirit is drawing you, okay? Drawing you. Uh, yeah, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay? So the indwelling is the Holy Spirit doing the work. Okay? The pouring out of the Spirit is Jesus doing the work. Okay? So it's two different parts of the Trinity that, that are taking... Am I making sense? Am I making sense tonight? Okay. Um, when, when I was teaching kids and Arlene, I'm sure you've probably used this example before you taught kids for so many years. When, when I'm trying to, to get children to understand the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's two examples that I use. It's like, number one, um, running through these walls in this, in this room, running through these walls are tons of electrical wires. We can't see them, but they're there, right? Okay. Until those switches back there are turned on, it doesn't matter that there's electricity running through these walls. It's there, right? But we have to turn that switch on to have the benefits, okay? All right. So... When we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, okay? However, there's a secondary work of the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's like throwing that switch, okay? So I had one night, I got the kids together and I brought a blow dryer upstairs and I wet my hair. Yeah, when you're a children's pastor, you do crazy stuff. So I wet my hair, and I picked up that blow dryer, and I just stood there and fanned myself with it. And I asked the kids, I said, is my hair? Good? Josh, I don't know, you may be. Were you there? <laughs> He's laughing at me. He's grinning back there because he remembers this. <laughs> See, I told you, I'm telling the truth. I just stood there and fanned myself with that hair dryer, and I asked the kids, I said, is this going to dry my hair? And they're looking at me like, she has lost her mind. And I said, eventually, 
eventually either my hair's going to dry on its own or the little wind motion I'm making with my hand will eventually help it to dry. And I said, okay, so I can, my hair will dry like this. But man, and I walked over and plugged that plug in the wall and threw that switch on and whew, I don't have a lot of hair. So two minutes flat, my hair is dry. And I said, that's the difference that the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit can make. Okay, I have it. It's here, but I hadn't turned it on, so I'm not getting all the benefits of it. Okay, does that make does that make sense? Kind of okay. Going back and forth. Okay, so let's move on to the to the next question. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, will you speak in tongues? Let, let me clarify that. When you are initially baptized. In the, in the Holy Spirit, will you speak in tongues? Okay. And, okay. And, and that, you know, that brings up another conversation probably is, you know, when do you receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you have to be saved so long before you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And absolutely not. We see evidence in Acts where the, uh, uh, the house of Cornelius was sitting and listening to the word and they were immediately saved and immediately filled at that particular moment. But, but the question that I'm trying to get at here is, and let's just put it like this. Do you believe that, that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit that it will be evidenced be, with, a, with that prayer language? Do you believe that? Okay. There is substantial proof in God's word for us to stand on, on these issues. There are five times in the book of Acts that either an individual or a group is baptized in the Holy Spirit. We find this, if you're going to jot this down, and I've got so many scriptures, we're not going to go to every one of them tonight. But you can jot this down if you want to go and look, look at this later. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 18. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 47. And Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. If we were to take the time and read through all of those, we would see that out of these five times that this is brought up in, in um, the New Testament here, out of these five times, three of them, it specifically says they spoke with other tongues, okay? The other two, it is implied. So I want to just mention the other two where it is uh, implied. Um, in Acts chapter 8, you know, this is when the, when the sorcerer was following along, and he, he saw the conversion of the believers, and, he, and something happened. The scripture doesn't say they spoke in tongues, Okay, but it said he saw something, and what did he do? He said, I'll pay you to give me that power. So something had to, he had to have seen an outward manifestation for him to know that that was something worth having. Okay, so it's implied right there. Um, Acts chapter 9 is the account of Ananias laying hands on the apostle Paul, okay, to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say in that passage that Paul spoke in tongues. But over in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, we know uh, in his writings to the church at Corinth that he talked about speaking in tongues, that he did speak in tongues, okay? So, you know, we can, we can ration it out in all five accounts right there. So, next question. Who is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for? Who's it for? Some believers, every believer. It is for all believers. What did, what did Joel say? I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants, upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. Young, old, rich, poor, black, white, 
Jew, Gentile, male, female, all, all believers. And then Acts chapter 2, verse 39 is another hallmark verse that we stand on to say that tongues is for today. Okay? There are a number of people, a number of denominations that teach that tongues ceased. Okay? But Acts chapter 2, verse 39 says, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Holy Spirit is given to all believers, we know, okay? We've already said it's impossible to be a believer without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But it's God's will that all believers experience not only the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but also the empowering of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, So I just just have a question, okay? How many of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Okay. All right. So if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, how many of you speak in tongues on a regular basis? Okay. All right. Let's get into the scripture now, okay? Thank y'all for participating, answering questions, and hopefully some of that has just been a reminder or been informative right there. Um, You know, the disciples' world had been turned upside down. And, you know, they had followed Jesus for three and a half years. They were, you know, they saw him, they believed him to be the Messiah, but they thought he was going to set up an earthly kingdom, Okay, Um, he was killed on a cross by the Romans. Then he was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And then for 40 days, he spent time with his disciples. And Jen talked about this last week. Um, Before he ascended to heaven, he gave the disciples this massive mission. Okay, and what did he tell them to do? Go into all the world. And share the good news of who he was, okay? Jesus gave them this mission to do, but there was no way they could do it on their own. Absolutely no way they could do it on their own. Has God ever asked you to do something and you felt like, there is no way? Anybody ever (laughs) been there? There is no way. Their hearts and their lives had been transformed, okay? But they were ordinary people, and they needed an extraordinary power for what was coming next. So let's jump over to Acts chapter 1. This is right before Jesus is fixing to ascend to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised you. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Jesus says, Go, wait. Don't do anything. Y'all, if I had a dime for every time I got ahead of God, I would probably be a rich person you know I am I the only one that does that you just you know and sometimes I'm jumping into what I think God's told me to do and it may not have been God telling me but then sometimes he's telling me to do something and I'm getting way I put the cart before the horse and I'm getting way ahead of myself he says wait wait you you're gonna have to have the power look at verse um eight Chapter, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was the power that he said was going to come. They already had the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. Okay, so this was that extra power. This was the empowering by the Holy, the Holy Spirit that we're talking about, or the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, now let's, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, wait a minute, I thought Pentecost was the day that the New Testament church received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't that what Pentecost is? No, no. Pentecost was here a lot, a long time before Acts chapter 2. Okay, because Pentecost, pent, pent meaning five, okay, occurred 50 days after the Passover, and it was a celebra- celebratory, let's see if I can say that right, it was a celebration, okay, like we would have Thanksgiving, okay, this was a time of Thanksgiving and celebration for the first harvest of the wheat crop, did you know that? Is that, is that, okay, so why were the, why were the crowds, you know, we think about the Acts chapter 2 story and we think about the thousands that came to Christ, the thousands that heard that, why were they there? They came for the Feast of Pentecost, okay, which had happened 50 days after Passover. Pentecost always came in conjunction with Passover. No Passover, no Pentecost, Mm. Now, where am I going with this? Okay, what made Acts chapter 2 so different is that the Passover that year was different because the Passover that year is when Christ became the lamb and the sacrifice on Calvary, okay? So that Passover was different than any other Passover that there had ever been. Okay, so with, without the Passover, there could not be a Pentecost. Without Christ's sacrifice on the cross, there could be no baptism in the Holy Spirit. You see the parallel that, that's going on right there? Okay, so Acts chapter 2, verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly... There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and every one present. It doesn't say some. It says every one present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages just that they made up. No. As the Holy Spirit enabled them as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Every one of them. Every one of them. Now you got to understand what they had been doing. For 10 days they had been fasting and praying and seeking and asking the Lord What would happen if we spent 10 days doing that? What would happen to our church if just two or three or five or one fasted and prayed for 10 days straight? Wow. And all of a sudden, here is this supernatural experience that occurs. Three, three supernatural things happen here. Number one, the, the mighty wind. They heard the mighty wind. Okay. Number two, flames of fire appeared on the heads. And number three, they spoke in languages that they did not know. Now, of these events that took place... This was the only time that all three of them occurred. 
okay? We don't hear about the windstorm again, and we don't hear about the tongues of fire on the head anymore. But I gave you scriptures, all those scriptures I called out earlier, those are the evidences that the tongues was still in effect and still going right there, okay? Read on verse 5. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, uh, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Notice what that says. They weren't saying, oh, wow, I got the Holy Ghost and I got goosebumps running up and down my back and I ran around the church and I shouted and I jumped over the pews and I swung from the chandeliers and wow, wasn't that a good service. Is that what they told What did they tell? They told the gospel. They told the good news of Jesus Christ. They could have told about their experience. But the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit is for boldness to tell the gospel, right? So... What is the danger of pursuing a Pentecostal experience, wanting the baptism of the Holy Spirit without first putting our faith and trust or seeking after Jesus? It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not the tongues we're supposed to be seeking. We're supposed to be seeking the giver of the gift. Amen? So right out of the gate, as soon as this happened to the believers, they went out and they, and they began to tell people. And the first things they were telling them was not about what they had experienced, but about who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And, and then in verse 14, here's old Peter. You know, if you go back and study about Peter, what do we know about Peter? Peter was so quick to talk. You know, he was just, he was so quick to talk and so quick to meddle and so quick to get in everybody's business and try to, but his mouth got him in trouble and he had denied Christ three times. But here it is, Peter. You know, he'd made things right with the Lord prior to this day. But Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd. This is verse 14. Listen carefully, all you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk like some of you are saying that they are. Nine o'clock in the morning is way too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. He didn't say the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel talked about the indwelling, right? Joel talked about the outpouring. Okay, so the gift of the power from the Holy Spirit immediately, instantaneously goes to work in Peter's life. And this is the same man that had said, I don't know Jesus, because he was scared to death for his life. Okay? Just just two months before. Okay? Okay? And now what's he doing? He's got the boldness, and he stands up, and he tells, and if we read the whole rest of this chapter, it, it would, it would, he tells the whole gospel message from beginning to end. Jump over to verse 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must... Seek the Holy Ghost. 
Is that what he said? No. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And verse 41 tells us what happened. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 souls. Now, in, in Bible times... Women and kids didn't count. They only counted men. I guarantee you there were women and children in that crowd. So, you know, the number probably much more. I think it's very fitting. You know, God does everything perfectly. If you stop and think about what do we say Pentecost was, it was a thanksgiving or a celebration for the first fruits of the harvest, the wheat harvest. Think about the timing of when Christ poured out his spirit to enable his, his followers to share the gospel, to reap the harvest of souls. What more appropriate time than during the Feast of Pentecost to initiate the, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit that was going to empower his believers to go tell everybody else about, about him. And even that day, that very day, more than 3,000 souls. Powerful. No wonder what we think of Pentecost eclipses what the true original meaning of Pentecost was. Here's the amazing thing. God is still pouring out his spirit today. He still wants to pour out his spirit. It's still for everyone who believes. And I'll say again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not, is not some feather in your cap for salvation or anything like that. This, this is to, it, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit helps us to live out our salvation. Okay? That's why I said a little while ago, I don't want to try to go to heaven without, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can, you can do it. You don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus knew we were going to need power. Y'all, if we ever needed the power of the Holy Spirit, we need it now. We need his power now. And the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead. He Okay, the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the fruit of the Spirit pouring through our lives. And like Papa Roy illustrated with the barrel that was almost full. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, it just begins to overflow. We need the fruit of the Spirit overflowing. Overflowing. Our world. I'm not a doomsdayer. I know what the scripture says. Okay? Our world is spiraling. It has been since creation, but I believe it's in a it's in a expedited mode right now. We need the the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to get up in the morning. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to go to work, to go to school, to, to go to the grocery store. So much evil abounds in the world. And God is giving us a tool 
a weapon, if you would. It can be both a a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon. And he's given us that to, to give us the power to do what we need to do for his kingdom and to win souls for him. And time is growing short. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. There's not a, for those of you that, are, that have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's not a formula. I can't give you a formula tonight to tell you how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. What I can tell you is fall in love with Jesus. Just fall in love with Jesus and then say, God, I want everything you've got for me. Position yourself. Okay, communing daily with God, in the word daily with God. Worship the Lord. Position yourself to receive and let Jesus take care of the rest. Okay. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no time like the present to ask. Okay, there's no time like the present to ask. You don't have to be in church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wasn't in church. I was in my dorm room in college. Huh? In your living room. Who who was not in church when you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Who anybody how many others were not in church? Several. Okay. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be at an altar here to, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have to be in communion with God. Would you describe your Christian life as one filled with power? These are just thoughts for your, for your own. You don't have to answer these out loud to me. Just, just think about these as I'm asking this question. Do you consider your Christian life to be filled with power? If not, why not? Do you have questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, that we haven't covered tonight? And I'm sure, you know, there's, we could have, you can't get this done in one, in one session. You can't. Now, our Bible study that we're doing, is, you know, this is the night to do that. You, you can't get a discussion on the baptism of the Holy Spirit done in, you know, 50 minutes. But if you have questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you have questions about speaking in tongues, then you need to seek out a spirit-filled believer and sit down and say, I need to know some things. I promise you this. If they are spirit-filled, they will help you. They're not going to look down on you. They're not going to ridicule you at all. They, They are going to be more than willing to help you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to seek. Don't be afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be a seeker. Be a seeker. And ask the Lord. The Bible says that our Father is willing to give us good gifts. And this is a gift that he desires for all believers to have. Everyone. All. If you are spirit filled, are you spending communion with God every day? Are you praying in your heavenly language every day? If not, why not? Take that challenge, step up, find that time of communion with God. But it's not about the tongues. It is not about the tongues. The tongues is only the initial physical evidence. If all you do is speak in tongues, you're not worth anything to the kingdom. The tongues is the evidence of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. If you are full of the Holy Spirit, let it be shown through your works for the kingdom 
through the fruit of the Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, pray and ask God for the gifts. I would love nothing more than to see all of the gifts of the Spirit in full operation in this body of believers. But that won't come by sitting here twiddling my thumbs and saying, oh, I sure do wish that would happen. That comes by us as believers saying, Lord, I I want you to use me. God, I'm surrendering myself to you. I'm I'm surrendering. Our tongue is the hardest thing to tame. James tells us that. If we can can submit our tongue to Christ and he can can fill us with the Holy Spirit and, 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 and give us that heavenly language, if we can submit that, then we can surely submit everything else. And we just say, Lord, I submit myself to you. Use me in whatever way you see fit. If it's a word of wisdom, if it's a a word of prophecy, if it's a gift of healing, if it's a, you know, I would love to see all of that happening within our body. But it only happens as we as believers humble ourselves before the Lord and submit ourselves to God and saying, Lord, where am I lacking? Where am I lacking? I can't sit and say, well, our church doesn't do this and our church doesn't do that. Because you know what I'm saying? I don't do this and I don't do that. Because I'm the church. You're the church. I want to just challenge you tonight. Fast and pray. Ask God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not only in your life, but in the lives of everybody in this congregation. Ask him for a manifestation of his power. Ask him for an outpouring with with gifts and manifestations. And let's watch. And let's watch God do far and away more than we think. Amen? Amen. Father, Thank you so much for this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. Both the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that gives us salvation and the outpouring or empowering of the Holy Spirit that gives us the boldness to do service for you. Father, I pray you would quicken our hearts, you would quicken our spirit, Lord. Give us a desire, give us a hunger, Lord, like we have never experienced before. God, I want to see your power poured out in this church. I want to see it from children's church to the nursery, to the youth, to the altars, from the youngest to the oldest. God, I want to see your presence fall in this church to the point where we cannot even minister. We can't stand in your presence. Not for the experience, but, Lord, for the empowering and the sending out. Would you do it in our midst? Would you do it again, Lord? Pour your spirit out, God. Pour your spirit out. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We submit ourselves to you. And we say, start with me. Start with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, as we leave tonight and we go to our separate homes, I pray, Lord, for traveling mercies tonight in the weather. And, Lord, with the impending winter weather around our nation and with the heavy storms and the rain that's supposed to be coming in tomorrow, Lord, I pray that you would provide safety for your people. Lord, tonight I lift the, the... the residents of Quito, Ecuador, to you. God, where the, the floods and the rain and the mudslides have taken so many lives, God, we lift them to you right now. God, there has been tragedy around our nation today and school shootings and awful things, police officers killed and so many different things. God, Lord, we cry out to you for our nation. We stand in the gap tonight, Lord. Help us to rise up, Lord, as an army and go forth to do your work in these last days through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Be careful.